Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, ladies and gentle germs. Welcome back to another video. Today is day numero 14 of the 14-day video a day challenge for the month of June. And to wrap up this <laughs> saga, if you will, 14 days of consistent video uploads, <sighs> I was thinking on what I wanted to do for my final one. I wanted to talk about something that honestly would be the end of the journey, you know? And I was uh, looking back at the videos that I have uploaded and the videos that I haven't. And there was one in particular that I know <laughs> upon just glancing, I knew this would be the one. This would be the perfect cap off to this journey. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be talking all about Avengers Endgame. <laughs> and boy, what an end it was. So, yeah, we are almost uh, two months removed from the release of Endgame. So, this is going to be a no holds bar spoiler filled discussion because by now, if you haven't seen the movie, uh, what's going on? I'd actually be very curious to see if anyone hasn't seen the movie. I mean, the film has grossed over $2.7 billion at this point. So, yeah, be wary of the spoilers. Okay, so, fuck man, I don't even know where to begin to be honest. This isn't going to be the most coherent review that I've ever done. Uh, there are going to be probably a couple of things that I'm just going to remember in passing, so it, it might seem like I'm rambling or you know running all over the place trying to collect my thoughts, but that's what this movie has done, and especially considering I haven't seen the movie in well over a month. Avengers Endgame was a very important movie if you will i mean this this is the end this was wrapping up an 11 year cinematic journey the likes of which we have literally never seen done before you know regardless of what you think about the marvel cinematic universe movies i know it's kind of cool now to hate on them and their formula and, and all this stuff you cannot deny what it has done for cinema it's literally changed it the entire process of a shared universe the entire process of bringing these comic book characters to life on screen and they interact with one another in their own movies in team up movies that's never been done before on this scale the closest thing you could think of involving characters that cross over one another in a universe would be the, the kaiju movies from japan that was the only really major contender for a shared universe and if you want to, I guess, say it's a universe, but not really, you know, the dark monsters, you know, from way back when the Universal Monster movies, but none of them are were ever on the scale of the MCU, you know, just starting out from the original Iron Man and wrapping up phase one with Avengers and then phase two and then phase three. And shoot, now we're, we're it's not even going to be called the phases anymore, but starting with Spider-Man Far From Home. You know, that's going to be the, the, the start of Phase 4. Or is it the cap off of Phase 3? At this point, I don't even remember because this movie has made me a mess. I believe it is the start of Phase 4. No, wait, no. It's the cap off of Phase 3. I think it's similar to like how Ant-Man was supposed to be the start of Phase 3, but it was like the cap off of Phase 2, even though it came after an Avengers movie. But regardless of that, regardless, Avengers Endgame was very important. Uh, this was the direct sequel to Avengers Infinity War. And there was a, a lot of expectations riding on it. Um, this was going to be the first three-hour Marvel movie. The first three-hour superhero movie. People are wondering how that's going to work out. Because it's always been a fleeting dream if you are a comic book fan to get a film that's ever that length. I mean, we thought we were bawling when we got movies that were two hours, 28 minutes. Like, I remember when The Dark Knight first came out and everyone was like, whoa, this is such a long movie. But it, it was well worth it. At least in my opinion. You know, everyone's... Everyone and their dog has turned on that movie, which sucks because it's great. Um, but yeah, this is literally the first three-hour movie. And I know that's been a point of contention for some people, saying that the length of the film doesn't really matter. If you're capping off an 11-year journey with multiple characters, especially after the events of Avengers Infinity War, you deserve a three-hour runtime. The Russo brothers have earned that after Winter Soldier, Civil War, Infinity War... Endgame, all within the span of, what, five years? Yeah, they definitely earned that. And the movie is just so much better because of it. You know, that's that's one thing that... Uh, 
always it's very particular when it comes to talking about these movies and finales more often than not the finales end up fizzling out instead of having a bang since we mentioned the dark knight i mean the dark knight rises let's be real about life for a second people that was not the third act that we should have gotten they're, they're capping off a batman trilogy acting like this is the end of everything when this batman has barely done anything you know they're just yeah regardless of that i will say that a lot in this video uh avengers endgame definitely deserved that three hour runtime and it is so so much better for it because these characters for the first time in a while get to have half the movie where they can just breathe and deal with the events of avengers infinity war one thing that we notice in a lot of movies that has a really um cataclysmic event such as thanos snapping away half the life in the universe is they'll they'll usually mope around for like five ten minutes and then they'll get motivated to do their thing uh, avengers endgame basically says no no these people are going to be broken by it so there were a lot of characters who for the most part, you thought they were going to act one way. And then you see them in Endgame and you're like, bro, these are broken people. They really are broken individuals. It's not just moping for the sake of moping. Everybody deals with the internal struggles differently. And it's honestly very believable. And what was really cool about Avengers Endgame is that some of the things that I thought were problems, like certain characterizations, upon a second viewing... I really didn't see them as such because it made sense within the context of the movie. Because while the characters themselves haven't changed, the way that they react seems very believable. And it's not one of those situations where, like, take Batman versus Superman, for example. The way in which people try to justify Bruce Wayne being a psychopathic murderer was that, oh, he lost Jason Todd when we didn't see that happen. We just saw his outfit there and the Joker spray paint and whatever jokes on you. And we just had to assume and infer all that stuff as opposed to actually seeing it. You know, this movie is too deep for you. That was the phrase that people threw around. But with Avengers Endgame, we got the unique opportunity to see these characters grow. And one of which, I actually, I, at first when I saw his journey, I, I was not a fan of it, but seeing where he ended up and where he is now, I, I, I'm just completely convinced at his characterization. That is Thor. Now, Thor, in my honest opinion, has not been a character at all in these movies until Thor Ragnarok, which is very, very funny. And I think that's the general consensus because Thor... I mean, he's he's great when he's working with the ensemble, but one thing we've noticed in all of his appearances prior to Ragnarok is that he was always just this rigid, stoic individual, and the reason why we got a, la a lot of laughs from him was when he deviated from that. Like, oh, here's this 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 god of thunder, and when something funny happens to him, it's like, ah, that's great, that's the whole appeal, but there really wasn't anything about Thor that we necessarily vibed with and we gelled and we related to. Like, his first appearance in Thor... Thor <laughs> in the first movie was the typical fish out of water story and dealing with the fact that you know your whole life is a lie and yada 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 and it's, it's the typical story so you can't you can't knock it but at the same time I'm not going to relate to it and then when you got to Thor the dark boar Thor the dark Thor Thor the dark world you're just like okay yeah I don't buy this so literally he was one step up from the Hulk the only exception is that the Hulk hadn't had any solo movies since 2008 Thor had two and it was like, yeah, it's like the Iron Man sequels. Let's just let's just forget that these happen. And, and at least in the Iron Man movies, we had Robert Downey Jr. In the Thor movies, we had Kat Dennings and Natalie Portman. Blah. But when you got to Thor Ragnarok, for the first time in a while, we actually saw Thor become a character. We saw Chris Hemsworth was able to breathe and he actually was able to be himself and add his genuine comedic timing to it. And I know a lot of people are very split and torn on Ragnarok. I was torn on Ragnarok when I first saw it, but upon rewatching it so many times, it's become like my top five favorite MCU movie. I love that film to death. It's so amazing. Um, but just seeing the way they handled Thor's character and how they were able to, how Taika Waititi was able to take his story and just take it from where it started in the first Thor movie about him being unworthy because he was a pompous arrogant prince and leading all the way into thor ragnarok and him basically 
you know, having his life flipped upside down, Fresh Prince style. You know, his father was dead. You know, his mother was killed right before his eyes. Now he finds out he has a murderous sister and his father wasn't, you know, this just shining beacon that he thought he was. And then leading that into Avengers Endgame, the Russo brothers were able to take what Taika Waititi did and all the other storylines and complete them. Thor has a very tragic story in these movies. You know, he goes from being this guy who has it all to being unworthy, to watching every single one of his loved ones die right before his eyes and becoming powerless. His brother is murdered literally right before him and he's helpless and he feels so powerless to him gaining the power to defeat the person who caused him so much pain only for him to lose yet again because he didn't go for the head. And then when he finally gets the opportunity to strike him down again, he still fails. He still fails. What does that do to a person? Honestly, sit back and tell me, what does that do to a person who goes from being able to take down this guy and then still losing? He has the last laugh. That breaks people. That seriously does. So I know a lot of people assume that Thor's character take was done for comedic effect and oh, fat Thor and then fat shaming and all this stuff and whatever. That's not unbelievable at all. A lot of people deal with what Thor went through in very similar ways. Some of which they try to bottle up. Some of which they're just very open. They try to find different outlets. But if you're honestly telling me that that's not believable whatsoever, that you see that Thor is still broken, he can't deal with it. Like, yeah. But what's really beautiful and what really brings this journey, you know, just like all together is when he's having the conversation with his mother, you know, when he finally got so much need closure with her and he finds out that he is indeed still worthy. You know, depression doesn't make you any less worthy. That was a beautiful, beautiful thing that we learned in the movie. And it's part of the reason why I loved his character journey so much. It's part of the reason why I loved a lot of the characters and what they went through in this movie. That being said, however, just because I like what they did with Thor in this does not mean that I am okay with what they did with some of the other characters. Like the Hulk, for example. Okay. Okay. This is going to be a doozy to explain because we all love the Hulk. We do. You know, whether you're a fan of the Edward Norton interpretation or the Mark Ruffalo interpretation, whatever. The Hulk is cool. But the Hulk in these movies really hasn't had much to do. He's only been there to just to serve as, like, basically, if they ever needed to get something done, the Hulk has been there, you know? A lot of the stuff that the Hulk goes through in these movies, you could write it for another character and it really wouldn't change that much. Like, his whole inclusion in Thor Ragnarok was great, but he really didn't need to be there. He was just a nice addition. And in Avengers Endgame... He's basically just there to do smart guy stuff. That's literally what it is. And then because he has the gamma radiation, he's able to wield the gauntlet and then snap. And, and that's all he does. The whole Professor Hulk thing, I understand what they were going for. They wanted to show that he's more than just the brawn. You know, he has the brain. So it is a case of subverting expectations, if you will. But come on, it's the Hulk. Like, the Hulk deserves so much more. We wanted to see that rematch with Thanos. And uh, yes, this is this is now getting into a case of me being an uptight fan. But realistically, the Hulk, we haven't really seen him shine since the first Avengers movie. And that was back in 2012. In Age of Ultron, he was kind of like... And then we didn't see him until Thor Ragnarok. And then he got his butt kicked in Infinity War. So he's just kind of there in the background, which... If they're making this an ongoing story and he's going to be in more movies doing other stuff, cool. But as it stands, the Hulk is not really the Hulk. You know, he's just there. And I'm, I'm kind of disappointed at that. I at least wish that he was able to get more fights in throughout this entire cinematic universe. But Universal, yeah, they're still being kind of bitchy when it comes to the rights. So maybe if we got more Hulk movies, we, we'd be satisfied with at least what they're doing here. But... I digress. Now, let's talk about some of the other characters, uh, some of which who made appearances in Endgame, but were in Infinity War. <laughs> my boy Clint, Hawkeye, a.k.a. Ronan. They did my boy right. My boy got his justice. This, this, man, isn't it a coincidence 
that the one Avengers movie that Hawkeye isn't in, they end up losing. And the second he comes back, hmm, I rest my case. That's literally all I want to say about Hawkeye. I, I freaking love him. And I love his character in these movies because that's one of the things I, I don't understand about people. They're always like, why is Hawkeye on the team? Hawkeye can't do anything. He's just a dude that shoots arrows. Um, how does that make him different than Black Widow? She shoots guns. She, he, she's a trained assassin. He shoots arrows. He's a trained assassin. Like They're literally the same thing, you know? But a lot of people give Black Widow a pass because she's got more screen time. What I love about Hawkeye is that he knows that he is just so outgunned and outclassed. And he's running around with gods and dudes who are in weapons of mass destructions and super soldiers. But he's like, you know what? It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, if you put your life on the line, if you step out on the battlefield, you're an Avenger. And that's all that matters. And all he wants to do is just protect his family so he can see them. It's very beautiful and it's very noble and it's something that we should all aspire towards, man. Like, just like the, what we got in Avengers Age of Ultron was his character. And we found his family and then going forward in Civil War and what he risked and sacrificed just to save his friends. And then putting himself on house arrest and then now showing up in this with his family disintegrated right before his very eyes. It's, it's a tragic tale, man. It seriously is. But I love it. And I love that in the end, Hawkeye got his family back. It was, it was so good, man. It was so freaking good. <laughs> so in terms of like the the character arcs and progressions in this movie for the six original avengers they were all handled um very very well for the most part there were a couple of moments involving some of the ogs uh that i will get to later that i was kind of questioning <laughs> one in particular the star spangled man with the plan um but one character in particular i think more so than anybody <laughs> it's so funny because the Russo brothers, Marcus and McFeely, the writers of the, all these movies, they literally took all of my grievances that I had with the character and they were able to make them non-existent. Or at least in the context of these movies, they made them work and gel and flow. And that is with Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man. So... Iron Man has been, I don't want to say he's been a mixed bag. He's, he's the most popular Avenger. We all know this, right? You know, he's the one who started this all. From the first Iron Man movie leading into Avengers Endgame, he's had a very rocky journey. Uh, he was kind of like the point of view character for a while for everybody because, you know, he was just this dude who had this, you know, billion dollar suit. And then he just ends up getting involved with all these gods and monsters and things in his wildest imaginations he couldn't believe. But what I started to notice with the character is that the writing for him suffered as we got into his sequels. Uh, and then in Iron Man 3, they did a lot of things in that movie that were just kind of questionable to the point where, yeah, you don't really need to watch Iron Man 3 to understand what's happening in the universe going forward, which I think is the biggest sin because you can't skip over the Captain America sequels. You just cannot. You can't skip over Thor Ragnarok and expect to know what's going on. You just can't. But with Iron Man 2 and 3, honestly... Somebody could tell you like the bare minimum, like Iron Man 3 introduces Rhodey is War Machine, Black Widow, Nick Fury, and that's all you need to know. I said Iron Man 2, right? Iron Man 3, uh, Pepper gets in a suit and uh, Tony has PTSD that's really never referenced again. Yeah, that's literally it. And, and that's my biggest complaint with it because, like, his character was done so well in the first movie and his characterization going forward has just been so ugh because he's been the most popular Avenger. I, I just feel like they should have had better writers on him, you know? And then you get into Avengers Age of Ultron, which starts his um, journey, his descent into madness because he starts getting really paranoid, as I'm sure everybody ha has seen. You know, he he's the one who went up there with that WMD and he saw Thanos's army. And after the events of Age of Ultron where Sokovia was destroyed, you know, he has that weight on him. Uh so his reaction leading into Civil War is just very believable while we all were like team Cap and team Iron Man this or whatever. At the same time you couldn't really blame Tony and he was nowhere near as draconian as he was in the Civil War comic because in the Civil War comic, I don't like to say this, but this is the best way I could describe it. He was essentially comic book version of adolf hitler he was because he was literally throwing people into the negative zone if they even had the slightest disagreement with him which is sort of the case of american politics today particularly on the left but anyways i digress yeah what he did 
there in Civil War and how he was like where he was coming from. You know, the way he was going about it, I didn't agree with, but he was coming from a good place, which is how a lot of us are in these situations. And they just continued that into Avengers Infinity War and Endgame. And it was just handled beautifully because by the time you get to the end of it, this man went from always having a plan, always being able to weasel his way out of something, being the smooth talker, to literally just sacrificing his entire life for the universe. But more specifically, he sacrificed his life so his world can live on. And by his world, I mean his daughter. You know, Tony Stark, this billionaire playboy philanthropist, settling down and having a kid. And that affecting his just viewpoint on how he handled things and being scared on top of that and realizing that in order to protect his world and go forward, he has to, he has to man up and do this. And I had I had he known the outcome of what would happen, had um, Doctor Strange told him what would happen, I don't believe that he would have made the the call that he did to sacrifice himself because he'd probably try to find a way out of it. But it's because he knew that there was only one outcome. He just acted off of instinct, and it was it was beautiful, and that's what made his death so impactful <laughs> you know i'm getting kind of emotional thinking about it because i didn't expect his death to impact me a lot because i used to crack jokes saying like yeah you know you know tony stark you know they're trying to make him the face of the mcu or whatever but the way that they just wrapped up his character's journey was just so beautiful and you know when he was <laughs> when he was on his um his proverbial deathbed if you will you know tony stark's always got to have the last word he's got to he got to make a joke about something and he just he couldn't he could barely speak you know, and then he just sits there and he he just dies, you know, surrounded by the people he loved and he protected and he can finally rest. You know, that that's some deep that's some deep shit, man. Tony Stark does have a heart and Robert Downey Jr.'s performance in the past decade has been nothing short of amazing. It's, it's phenomenal. And, and I loved it. I, I loved his character. As you can see, I'm getting kind of emotional about this because for the first time ever they wrap up a character's journey in his arc and they show that he's a flawed and imperfect individual but at the end of the day you know he still makes the right call i don't think we've ever actually seen that before you know like you saw in the dark knight rises with bruce wayne sacrificing himself just so he can go party with a hot chick in italy in an open air cafe you know we, we've come a long way since 2012, I'll say that. Now moving into uh, Captain America's closure, if you will. Now, this is one of my major contentions with the movie. Um, the way it ends off with Captain America going back in time to live out his days with Peggy Carter. I know a lot of people are like, oh, it's so beautiful and it's symbolic. And he finally gets to have his happy ending after being a man lost out of time and everything guys i know you want everything to be a happy ending and be all hunky dory especially as a contrast to tony stark passing away but just because captain america had this okay 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 mm -mm. i love captain america he's my favorite avenger but can we stop this whole notion that Peggy Carter was the love of his life. Okay, maybe it was because that movie was in 2011, or maybe it was because it was set in World War II, and if you meet someone within 45 minutes, you know you're going to marry them, or whatever. I don't, I don't know. But nothing about their relationship was really that believable. She admired him because of his never-give-up mentality. You know, the, the shonen character aesthetic. You know, I could do this all day. But does that really make for a romantic side of things? Maybe if they had more going for them. And then he went under the ice? Possibly. But as it stands, we saw Captain America move away from that. We saw him come back into this time. You know, he was a man who has fought his entire, not even his entire life in war, really. I mean, he only fought for a little bit. And then he went under the ice and he came back and he was doing the war stuff again. But he, he kind of had to learn to move on from it and adjust. And yes, one of the main reasons why he was so hell-bent on saving Bucky in Civil War was because Bucky was his last link to 
that reality, that timeline. It, it, it just showed that, you know, being a soldier and just growing up and dealing with these things is a part of life. And just because Peggy passed away doesn't mean that his life is over just because, you know, he doesn't have someone here. And it just makes things just a little bit more creepy, if you will, because he kissed Sharon Carter in Civil War and you thought that was going to be a thing because they were kind of seeding it in Winter Soldier. And, you know, they do have a thing in the comics. And then they just do this. And it's so weird because these this is the same people. It's not like Josh Whedon started that. And then these guys did this. It wasn't like it was a 180. No, Marcus and McFeely wrote that. The Russo brothers directed that. And then they just do this five years later. Like, really? What? I know they they might have tried to wrap it up in terms of fan service or whatever. Maybe bill it as that. But I just, I don't think Captain America would do that. I don't think he would ever just, just because the war is over for now, he would go back in time just to live out his days with her. And then that also complicates things in terms of like the time travel sort of thing, which we'll touch on in a bit. But yeah, I know a lot of people are saying it's a non-issue right now because, you know, Sam Sam Wilson is Captain America and, you know, just let Captain America have his happy ending. But, you know, sometimes a happy ending isn't this, you know, sometimes a happy ending isn't you just going back in time just because you can. Like, I just, I don't get it. Like he's lived in this timeline for a long time to experience a lot of things more so than he did back in the 1900s. You know, I'm sure his life has been a lot more fulfilling now than it was back then. And I don't, I don't know, man. I, I, I just don't know. But again, most of the complaints that I have for that, we will discuss when we get to the time travel section. Uh, as you can see here, this video is nowhere near done and we're 27 minutes in. Uh, if you're still watching this all in one take on the same night, uh, comment down below and let me know. <laughs> I'm curious to see. Um, let's talk about the uh, final Avenger of the original six, and that is Black Widow. Um, Black Widow in this movie, I think, is the strongest that she's ever been, uh, especially considering she's always been a supporting character. She's had more um, uh, profile, like higher profile appearances, like in the Captain America movies. I think she's been a great secondary character. Uh, but in this one, you just get to see a whole different side of Scarlett Johansson and how she's trying to hold the team together. But at the same time, it's eating her alive and just what this sort of thing does to people. And then sacrificing herself at the very end to get the soul stone so everybody could survive. I'm, I'm going to be real. I didn't really expect that to happen until I saw that who were the teams going to Vormir. And I was like, oh. But I was very surprised that they were able to kill off one of the original six Avengers like that. You know, I I, I knew at the very least one of the major ones would die. Like if it was between Iron Man, Cap, and Thor, I thought to myself, okay, Thor's just got a, a, a new wind of personality and he was been reborn. Essentially, there's no way he's going to die. Uh, Captain America and Iron Man will have to see. It's going to be one or the other. And at the very least, the other one's going to retire. Uh, they ended up doing both. And one of them did retire and one of them did die. But to kill off Black Widow, that's just... Wow, it's pretty ballsy, uh, especially considering Scarlett Johansson. Uh, but yeah, there, there's a lot of talk about her solo movie, which I'll probably discuss more when they actually announce the next phase. But um, yeah, I'm very, very sad to see her go. It was interesting that they recreated the scene from Infinity War where um, Thanos was sacrificing Gamora. They did the same thing here, but both Hawkeye and Black Widow were trying to sacrifice each other. That was pretty sad in the context of that. I know a lot of people didn't like that. It was kind of like shot for shot in terms of like the music playing and all that. But I think for what they were going for, it was great. And just, just seeing Jeremy Renner, you know, just give it his all and just be broken down by this, his best friend dying, you know, it's just, oof. it's a lot to take in. This movie is a lot to take in if you couldn't tell. Um, But yeah, we've covered the original six Avengers. There was a, another character I wanted to discuss and that was Thanos uh, because outside of him, there really weren't too many major, major characters in this movies. I mean, you had the supporting characters play a role. Like the other the other members, like Paul Rudd, he does a fantastic freaking job in this movie. Uh, and some of the other guys do good jobs too. But Thanos was like the only other big one. And it was really interesting because I was always questioning how they would incorporate Thanos in this movie. Because as you saw at the end of Infinity War, this dude's body was like broken down. Like no tomorrow after you use that gauntlet. As you can see, Thanos is a very powerful individual. But even then... The power of the gauntlet is the power of the gauntlet. So it was interesting to see how it affected him. And I was very surprised that they actually killed him off within the first 15 minutes of the movie. That was very interesting to see. 
and I always question like, okay, but how are they going to get Thanos? Like, you know how when you watch trailers and you watch like TV clips, you're like, okay, so wait, if they kill him off here, then who's that Thanos over there? <gasps> oh, time travel. So the Thanos that we see at the end of this movie and for the majority of the movie is the Thanos from 2014. And it's really interesting because I think this is a, a, a more of a savage Thanos. Like the Thanos that we saw in Infinity War was very, not laid back, but he was very content with what he was doing. He was not in like a rush to just wipe out half the life in the, in the humanity. Like he was just very zen because he already had the gauntlet. He already had two of the Infinity Stones. Nothing could really stop in his way and he accepted that. But in 2014, I think we saw a Thanos who was just like, yeah, I'm going to put my plan into motion. So he was very much so savage and brutal and i think him learning of the future reality and what it what it had done to him basically made him um just unleash more of that savage side which was cool to see uh but then again it did introduce a, a, a kind of an inconsistency in terms of his combat skills because as you saw in, in infinity war the Avengers were no match for Thanos, right? But some of them were putting up a, a decent job against him. You know, like the battle on Titan and everything. You saw all the Avengers. No, they weren't all Avengers. But, you know, you saw all the good guys fighting Thanos. And they were putting up a pretty good fight. A decent fight, if I'd say so myself. And then when you see him in this movie, he was able to solo Iron Man, a powered-up Thor, and Captain America wielding Mjolnir pretty easy. Which is just very strange considering this is the Thanos who doesn't have the gauntlet. So I was just like, what's going on here? I mean, you could say that maybe the Avengers are just beaten down. And just maybe this Thanos is a lot more, you know, like he, he already knows that the gauntlet exists and it's fully crafted. So he doesn't have to extract information from one of them. Maybe he was holding back on Titan because he wanted to get the time stone. But... Yeah, I just thought it was very strange. It was just very inconsistent in terms of the scaling here. But uh, who's to say what happens, you know? Or what did happen? I'm not sure. I mean, I, I don't get it. Like, it's just... Thor had Stormbreaker. And he had Mjolnir. And Thanos was whooping his ass. What happened? I don't get it. I don't get it. Anyways. You know, we might as well just wrap up characters before we get into the whole time travel thing. Why was Captain Marvel in this movie? why oh that's right because yeah yeah we, we forgot to incorporate her in the other movies in just last minute because you know i mean i'm serious she had top billing she was in all the posters like i get it captain marvel was coming out a few months before endgame but you think that she was going to be like one of the leading avengers and she has a collective runtime of maybe like what 10 minutes in the movie of that she shows up does two things and then that's it now i'm not going to spin this in a whole like oh she's just there to appease the sws and all that no I, I could care less about that i'm actually for more strong and empowered women in these movies but we've had them we've had great ones like scarlet witch i'm telling you when these damn bugs flying everywhere <laughs> the window's open right now it's summer so you know when Scarlet Witch showed up and she was about to wreck Thanos, my theater went insane. But Captain Marvel, when she came and she literally pulled off two feats that were arguably cooler, nobody really cared because we haven't grown to love Carol. And she just shows up in this final battle. Yes, I know she does not steal the show. She doesn't land the final blow, which is what some people were expecting. But still, you, you kind of have to do stuff to earn and warrant the ability to hold off Thanos. Like, it's no tomorrow. Like, just to take a headbutt from Thanos. You know, she she never earned any of that. If she had been in more of the movies and we had grown to love Carol, I think so. But just everything surrounding Captain Marvel, the controversy and all that, just mm -mm. nope, nope, not my Captain. Mm -mm. Still going to be Captain America, who is now played by Sam Wilson. <laughs> but yeah, the, the the time travel angle in the movie. Uh, let's talk about that. I think that'll be one of the final points of discussion, because I was going to discuss the future of the MCU going forward. But that's that's a. We might as well just discuss that when they do announce it. I think they're doing it at D23, so I believe that's either next month or in August. So we'll just wait till then. <sighs> time travel in this film. I know a lot of people were like, oh, if they incorporate time travel, they are literally going to succumb to all the tropes, especially all the X-Men fans. They're just like, oh, so you guys will make fun of the X-Men timeline for breaking things by using time travel. But in this reality, they use time travel. Yeah, because 
the time travel of this movie knows what it wants to be. And it's not convoluted for the sake of rebooting it six times and all this crazy stuff that's still canon, but at the same time not canon and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Time travel in this is very, very simple. It doesn't operate under the Back to the Future 2 rules where if you do something here, it's going to affect your reality. Anything that you do and this new reality becomes the reality and your old reality becomes your, well, old reality. That's essentially what it is. So it's, it's very simple. So changing something in the past doesn't change your new reality. It just becomes what? No, <laughs> I'm sorry. See, I'm getting all the tongue tied. Cause I, I'm literally, I said back to the future. And then I started thinking of all the other time travel movies, changing something in the past does not affect your future. Your future becomes your old past and the past that you're in right now becomes your new future. So it's very simple in that respect. And I like the way that they handled it in this film because it was very simple, and easy to follow up until the very end of the movie because you start thinking things about what Captain America did. Now, a lot of people assume that when Captain America went back to return the stones, he decided to stay in 1945 and just live out his days until that exact moment where he came by. Now, if he were to do that, um, that complicates a few things. For example, this Captain America goes back in time. What happens to the Captain America that's in that timeline? Does he just stay under the ice forever? Does this Steve live in isolation this whole time? How would that work considering S.H.I.E.L.D., you know? How would that work with Peggy Carter being one of the top agents, top the founding member of S.H.I.E.L.D.? You know, she they would know who she's dating. And this guy looks suspiciously familiar to Steve Rogers. Uh, how would that work, you know? Um... And just Captain America, he has all this knowledge. And you're telling me that none of that stuff would change the timeline? Like, the whole Hydra infiltration and then Steve and um, his relationship with um, Robert Stark. Why, why am I saying Robert Stark? What the heck? <laughs> Howard Stark. <laughs> I'm thinking Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> with Howard Stark. Like, he wouldn't save him from the Winter Soldier stuff. Like... That's just kind of strange. So what does he do? He goes back and he lives in that reality. And then he just waits until they develop a time machine or something. Or he has the time machine. He has one more particle. And then he goes back just to sit there for them to see him. I I don't know. It's just so strange. I don't understand it. So he went back in time. Lived out his days with Peggy Carter. Until he felt like going back and just sitting there. Until they go do this thing. I don't get it. I don't, I don't get it. It's just time travel ish and then that opens another problem it, it potentially opens another can of worms because what happens if somebody wants to use time travel in future mcu movies as a cop out as a way to bring back characters now i'm not to say that they're going to do that um kevin feige if he's still on with these movies i don't think he would ever allow that but just looking at a lot of the movies that have abused time travel and all these things like a lot of the cw shows that use just certain tropes just to get certain characters back and to explain stuff that's the last thing we need I know they say they're going to keep these deaths permanent, but the last thing I want to see is for them to like rip Robert Downey Jr.'s conscience, you know, from this reality and put it into a suit and then make that. Ugh, I don't want that. I just no, please don't do stuff like that, please. And then to bring in alternate versions like from Earth this and Earth that. No, like the, when the Flash did it, it was cool for the first three seasons. Then it got old really, really fast. So I like the idea of time travel in this movie, but at the same time. I just I I just don't like where it could go because time travel is a is it's it's a very dangerous thing to meddle with ironically. Oh yeah yeah. But yeah, that's basically all I really wanted to discuss on Avengers Endgame in terms of everything that I felt was noteworthy like the character journeys and how they ended, uh, time travel and and, and the like. Uh, there were a lot of things that I loved in the film as a film, so the whole 3 hour runtime, it doesn't really feel like a 3 hour runtime which is the best compliment I can give a movie because more often than not films after, you know, you hit a certain point, you're just like, Oh, come on, let's get to the point. But in this movie, it's just jam packed with so much good stuff that the three hour runtime becomes non-existent. And it's great. In addition to that, just the attention to detail when it came to a lot of the, um, the, the, the flashback scenes, how they would go and they would de-age actors and, it really gives new um, light to certain situations and expands upon them, like how you see what happens after the Avengers um, kidnap, not kidnap Loki, but they deal with Loki and how they're going to go and steal the stone. 
um, you see what happens afterwards, and it incorporates some characters from The Winter Soldier, such as Robert Redford. Uh, he came back for this movie for a cameo, so that was really cool. And it just it it makes those films better because you get to see more of the stuff that happened on further on. Like in Doctor Strange, for example, you saw the Ancient One, um, and you're wondering what was the Ancient One doing during the Battle of New York? Oh, the Ancient One was there thwarting off some of the attacks. So that was just freaking dope, and just little things like that. There's just so many Easter eggs and callbacks to a lot of the older films and it makes those films better and just in general a lot of things that you know fans have wanted to see for the longest time like cap wielding mjolnir like things like that and the hail hydra thing like they just did a lot for the fan service of this movie and it genuinely worked it wasn't just fan service for the sake of fan service it was fan service with a purpose and it had passion behind it a lot of things in these movies they have so much love that went into them so avengers endgame man End of a freaking era, if I'll ever say that. This was honestly the best wrap-up that I've ever seen for a cinematic journey, you know? Lord of the Rings for the longest time was, like, the pinnacle for me. And I didn't think there was going to be anything that could ever top that. But Avengers Endgame did. It did. It just it wrapped up this universe just so beautifully. And it's so weird because this isn't the end. You know, this is just one chapter in a very very long ongoing story if the marvel movies were to end here i mean i'd I'd be satisfied but at the same time i'm just itching to see what else happens in the future you know this this bold new direction if you will it'll be interesting to see what they do anyways i've been talking for damn near 42 minutes i'm gonna cut this (laughs) i'm gonna cut this off right now you guys the 14 day video a day challenge is officially over I want to thank you guys so much for joining me on this journey. And for me to you for now, my name is NGS signing out. And like always, I'll catch you guys later. I love you 3000. Tony Stark.